Hello, I'm Dr Priscilla Harries, Head of Department for Clinical Sciences at Brunel University London. I'm recording this podcast on behalf of myself and Professor Carolyn Unsworth, who is Professor of Occupational Therapy at Central Queensland University in Australia. This podcast accompanies our two special issues on driving and community mobility, published in the British Journal of Occupational Therapy in 2015. Dr Harris, I'd like to ask you a series of questions, if I may. First of all, can you tell me about why the special issues on driving and community mobility were created and how they developed? Well, we know from research funded by the Department for Transport that health professionals in the NHS are not giving patients enough advice on how to manage their driving and community mobility needs. Patients need to know how their health or disability will impact on their fitness to drive and some may need referral for a clinic assessment or even an on-road assessment. In the UK, the most skilled assessments are conducted by expert occupational therapists at specialist mobility centres. However, occupational therapists in all areas of practice need to have driving as an area they can routinely consider with their patients, whether it's a young disabled person who wants to learn to drive or an older adult, for example, with early stage dementia. The Parliamentary Advisory Council for Transport Safety has recommended that healthcare providers need to be supported to be more effective in assessing fitness to drive. One way we can support our healthcare providers is through providing evidence of effective methods that can be used for assessment and rehabilitation in this field of practice. Carolyn and I therefore proposed a British special issue on the topic in order to share best practice in international approaches to driver assessment and rehabilitation services. We felt that occupational therapists in the UK could learn from the systems and practices in North America and Australia and advance this important area of practice. Practice has been developing more comprehensively in these countries. For example, occupational therapists have been legally authorised to make recommendations to the licensing authorities regarding fitness to drive in the state of Victoria in Australia since the 1980s. So the special issue was approved by the editorial board of the British Journal of Occupational Therapy in 2013 and we launched the call for submissions. We were overwhelmed with the response. We received a record number of manuscript submissions for a BJOT special issue call. I'd like to thank our peer reviewers who've worked tirelessly to identify a wide range of high quality international studies for dissemination. After peer reviews were completed, We actually had enough manuscripts for two complete special issues. One was published in February and this one in June 2015. So what topics do the special issues cover? Well, the first volume focuses on approaches to assessment related to the occupation of driving and community mobility. The second volume presents approaches to intervention. We start the first issue with the gold standard approach to identifying research evidence a systematic review. The review presents methods and assessments used to assess fitness to drive after a mild traumatic head injury. This paper identifies the means and timescales that can be used when making complex clinical judgments concerning resumption of driving. The next three papers focus on the assessment of two essential performance skills needed for driving, vision and cognition. The first paper advocates a clinic-based approach to assessment, recognising its value in the prediction of driving ability, whereas the second reflects on the inherent problems of clinic-based testing and advocates the need to test occupational performance in a naturalistic on-road environment. The third paper examines the interplay between the two by investigating the predictive validity of a cognitive clinic assessment in relation to on-road driving performance. A combination of clinical and on-road assessment, termed comprehensive driver evaluation, is recommended as the gold standard for occupational therapy driver assessment. Recognising the need for comprehensive driver evaluation, the next study, funded by the United Kingdom Occupational Therapy Research Foundation, examines how experienced occupational therapy driving assessors use both clinic-based and on-road assessment information to make fitness-to-drive recommendations. The penultimate paper examines the nature of the tasks and sequences that need to be included in an on-road driving assessment 
in order to make the content and construct validity sufficiently robust. The findings produce a useful international checklist against which occupational therapists can compare their own on-road testing protocols. The final paper examines the reliability of the assessors when undertaking on-road assessments for ageing drivers. Following a half-day training session, the assessors' inter-rate of reliability was very high. These last two studies both suggest that our experienced driver assessors are making consistent fitness-to-drive recommendations with excellent agreement. In the second issue, we present studies that focus on interventions to enable driving and community mobility. The issue opens with a paper examining occupational therapists' knowledge and attitudes towards giving advice on fitness to drive. Hawley and colleagues found that occupational therapists have a greater awareness and knowledge of UK guidelines on the medical standards of fitness to drive than psychologists and other health professionals. They suggest occupational therapists are well placed to expand their role in this practice area. The paper by Frith et al. systematically reviewed literature on return to driving following stroke and adherence to the guidelines on the medical standards and the extent to which stroke survivors routinely received education in the acute setting. The next two papers focus on supporting clients who have had mental health conditions to drive. McNamara et al. examine the lived experience of drivers who have bipolar disorder while Dunn and colleagues report on the Drive Safe initiative implemented in their mental health service to monitor and support client driving. Many driving clinics include the use of simulators to retrain or train driving skills. Mazer and colleagues' randomised controlled trial did not support the use of simulator training for clients in general with neurological impairments, but suggests that clients with moderate impairment may benefit. In addition, Nave and colleagues documented the advantages of clients being able to test and practice using vehicle modifications on the simulator prior to using these on the road. Although many individuals with health conditions can learn to drive or resume driving after an acquired incident or even maintain their driving despite age-related health declines, the complex skill level required to control a vehicle safely and independently is not always attained. The final papers examine occupational therapy interventions to support driving cessation. Liddle and colleagues report on the experiences of peer leaders who run educational support groups for older people undergoing driving cessation. And Chan et al. report on a driver retirement programme that can support older taxi drivers' transition from their worker and driver roles. So, what impact do you hope the special issues will have on occupational therapy? We hope we will advance evidence-based knowledge in this important field of practice. Occupational therapists are ideally suited to conduct clinical assessments of fitness to drive, to develop driver habilitation or rehabilitation programmes, to work with clients who are not able to learn to drive or who can no longer drive to ensure public transport independence. And finally, to support older drivers, not to relinquish their driver role prematurely. This is because occupational therapists focus on the interplay between health-related functional capacity and occupational performance. We understand how impairments affect performance in complex environments and how adaptive equipment and strategies can raise competence. For example, occupational therapists understand how cognitive difficulties may limit rapid and flexible thinking required to manoeuvre a vehicle safely in traffic. We know how to train clients in the use of compensatory strategies, such as paddle action, to overcome limited ankle movement, and how smart technologies can overcome physical barriers, such as remote control call systems, to request support to refuel a vehicle. Driving also promotes health outcomes. Quality of life is enhanced, worker and carer roles can be maintained, and above all, people value the independence that driving affords. That is why we need to support people to keep driving wherever safe and feasible, but help others who are not safe to drive to make successful transitions to other forms of community mobility. Why is community mobility important? Community mobility is an essential instrumental activity of daily living, 
We need to be mobile to access the community across our lifespan, using private vehicles as drivers or passengers, powered or manual wheelchairs, or public transport, as this enables us to visit the people and places that are central to everyday living and bring meaning to our lives. Community mobility enables us to participate in school, work, self-care, leisure and social activities that connect us to our communities. Together with inclusion and equality, occupational therapists champion the right for our clients to have access to our community and transport accessibility is a vital element of this concept. So finally, what are the key features of the special issues? The papers published in the first issue, together with the reference literature, revealed over 25 years of research evidence that occupational therapists can use to help them determine an individual's fitness to drive. Despite the lack of definitive answers, generalist occupational therapists, as well as those specialising in driver assessment, now have a toolbox of standardised assessments to help determine if clients should be referred to a specialist for evaluation or to undergo an evaluation to determine if they are able to drive safely and independently. However, for many clients, they're not able to access transport or commence, resume or cease driving without some sort of intervention. Therefore, the focus of the second special issue on driving and community mobility is on occupational therapy interventions that support access to the community. Findings from international research suggest that it is difficult to strike a balance between supporting individuals' right to drive and determining whether drivers are sufficiently skilled to ensure road safety for all users. Skilled clinical assessment of drivers and expertise in effective rehabilitation strategies play an essential role in getting this balance right. These special issues will support occupational therapists to be aware of robust assessment measures and effective rehabilitation strategies. This knowledge will enhance our decision making and help us to ensure we get this balance right. Dr Harris, thank you very much.